Olá, bem-vindos e bem-vindas. Um bom dia a todos. Eu sou Denise Barbosa e estamos aqui mais uma vez para o McKinsey Talks. O McKinsey Talks já se consolidou como um espaço para conversas ao vivo sobre temas relevantes para a agenda de negócios. E o tema de hoje é Blockchain, How It's Changing Your Industry From Within. Today we are joined by Ian DeBode, Associate Partner at McKinsey based in San Francisco. Good morning, Ian. Good morning. And here with me in the studio, Gustavo Tayar, partner at McKinsey based in Sao Paulo. Bom dia, Gustavo. Bom dia, Denise. Tudo bem? Tudo bem. And also Marina Mansur, associate partner at McKinsey based in Sao Paulo. Bom dia, Marina. Bom dia, Denise. Vale lembrar que vocês de casa poderão fazer perguntas durante toda a sessão utilizando o campo que fica à direita na tela ou embaixo. Se você estiver usando um celular, por favor, contribua. A participação de vocês é fundamental. Today, our session will be in English. Shall we start, Marina? Yes, thank you. So, before we start, we feel it's important just to set the basics of what a blockchain technology is. A lot of people talk about blockchain, but a lot of people do not, do not understand how the blockchain technology actually works. So I'm going to oversimplify and give you small examples of how this technology works, and then we'll go from there and I'll move to the experts for, for the hard questions. So what is blockchain? Whenever two people make a transaction, there is a middleman, there is a third party in the middle of it to secure that transaction. Those third parties in the traditional world are banks, notaries, remittance agents. And the, and, and the idea of having a third party is to provide security, to ensure the integrity of the transaction, and to keep the transaction record. But these third parties usually charge fees. They usually come with a lot of bureaucracy involved. They slow the process down. And there's, a, there's kind of like a lack of transparency on that transaction. So what the blockchain does is try to take out this middleman and be the third party of a transaction in a much more automatic, secure, and digitized way. So what is the blockchain? The blockchain is a collective bookkeeping by independent nodes that are able to validate those transactions. And I'm going to explain what the nodes are and how these transactions are validated. But what they do is they log in a public data, and it's public for everyone, and it's immutable because it doesn't change. They log all the transactions that happen on the network. With that, they provide integrity, redundancy, transparency, and with much lower transaction costs. So how does it work? It's a network composed for several nodes, also known as miners or notaries or validators. And those nodes, they have two characteristics. The first one is the processing power. So they have a lot of, a lot of power to process data and algorithms to validate those transactions. And the second main characteristic of a node is that it keeps The, his, the history of the bookkeeping of all the transactions happening in the blockchain. So let me give you a really simple example. And, and no, first of all, why we call it blockchain? Because it's actually a chain of blocks, right? So the, in this chain, you have several transactions. The amount of several transactions made a block. And the blocks are, are in a sequence in a chain. So all the past transactions can't be changed. They're immutable. And the balances and the validation, when a node is validating, he sees the whole blockchain, the whole history of that transaction. So let me give you a simple example. And again, I'm oversimplifying here just for the sake of the understanding. So imagine that you have multiple parties uh, broadcasting their individual transactions to the blockchain, to the network. So they announce the transaction that they want to make. Once that transaction is announced, one node takes that transaction and validates through algorithms, for example. And once that node validates the transaction, he, for once, broadcasts the new blockchain. So he updates the blockchain and broadcasts for all the other nodes what the, the new blockchain, the, the, new, the new chain is. Once a significant number of nodes accept the new blocks, so the other nodes have to validate the transaction as well, you have the transaction uh, finished, replicated, and completed. 
So I hope with that simple explanation, everyone is now on the same page of how the technology works. But here we have two experts on the subject and they will tackle the hard and complex questions. So Ian, first of all, thank you for your time. I know you're in San Francisco, so the time zone is crazy right now. So thank you for making the time to be here with us. And you have been working in several engagements with clients around the globe with the use of the blockchain technology. And I know there are different uses of the technology. We're going to talk about them in a few minutes. But I can imagine that for any clients, the first thought is, is it really secure? Is, is it really immutable and transparent and secure? So how secure it is and, and how the security works? Yeah. No, I think it's a great question and one that immediately often pops up, right? So I think uh, first and foremost, good to anchor on what do we mean by blockchain? Because there's various different types and what you just showed, I think is the, the, the simplified version of it. But just using the blockchain that Bitcoin is run on as the main archetype, right? If we take that as the blockchain that we refer to, a couple of observations. Because every block builds on the previous one, the data integrity of a system like this is phenomenal, right? It is to your, as you just mentioned, it is nearly impossible to go back in time and change a data entry because you would have to change all the blocks that fall on top of it. So the data integrity in blockchain has been proven to be very efficient and very good. Second piece is because of the decentralized network of these various nodes and all these validation nodes, it is actually quite good in terms of an uptime perspective uh, and a distribution perspective. So from an overall technology perspective, this is an incredibly robust piece of technology. It hasn't been hacked. The uptime of the Bitcoin blockchain, is something along the lines of 99.999% since 2011, right? It is an incredibly secure system that by now has had give or take 10 years to run and people feel very confident about the security. It's never really been hacked. What is worth mentioning though, is that blockchain does have issues, but it's mostly related to private key safety. So if a private key, which is basically the, kind of see it as your password to enter into the your ledger entry. If your private key is compromised, your wallet and your funds may ultimately be lost. But that tends to be on the individual, not related to the tech. The tech itself is incredibly secure, robust, and has been proven to be very. So Ian, you mentioned Bitcoin, which is, I feel, I feel like it's the commonly, uh, the most common uh, use of, of, of blockchain, right? And whenever someone thinks about blockchain, Bitcoin is, is the first thing that pops in their mind. So let's dig a, a little bit deeper into crypto assets. What are those crypto assets? Are they currencies? Are they equities? Um, uh, will, they, will they substitute the dollar? How does it work? Yeah, no, it's a very good question. And most crypto assets all get thrown into one category, uh, but the reality is there's various different types, right? Bitcoin, and there's various different blockchains. Bitcoin is a example of a native token that exists on a blockchain. Ethereum is uh, another uh, crypto that is typically well known as another native token. What we mean with a native token is that that is the particular asset token that is used to pay the mining network to validate the transaction. That's really the main function of it. And as a result, it's kind of like a utility and in the US they have been classified as commodities, right? There are on certain types of blockchains, many different types of tokens that could also be issued on top, such as Ethereum as smart contracts. Once you get into that, there's a whole set of other tokens, governance tokens, stable coins, et cetera, that tends to be enabled. But Bitcoin in and of itself, and Ethereum is in of itself is a native token that exists on the chain and that is used to pay the miners to validate a transaction. And one of the questions that, uh, and that goes back to the beginning of blockchain and to the crypto, to the crypto assets. Uh, everyone asks about money laundry. How do you avoid blockchain becoming a huge, uh, a huge network of money laundry, for example? 
Yeah, that is another really good question and one that gets asked almost every single conversation we enter, really. Um, you will have statements and quotes by public figures that also, and, and, and investment institutions, right, that say, you know, Bitcoin just shows you how much demand for money laundering there is in the world and some of these ransomware attacks that have happened kind of illustrate that point. I think the reality is if you look at what Bitcoin and most other crypto assets are primarily used for, it is for an investment use case and a store of value use case, right? Um, the most, the latest estimates actually say that only 0.3 to 0.5% of Bitcoin transactions can be related to illicit activities. The reason why we can say something like that in the first place is because the blockchain, the ledger that Bitcoin is run on, is public. And so what you can see is all these different wallet addresses and how the Bitcoin is flowing in between them. Once you know who owns a wallet address, you can then obviously start figuring out where what is the flow of funds actually look like. So if you know the wallet address of a dark um, a dark market or, or someone with illicit intent, you can then translate that to actual illicit activity. There are companies very specialized that have mapped out all these wallet addresses, chain analysis, elliptic. They've just raised a lot of money. They, those names tend to be familiar. Their field that is just dedicated to understanding the flow of funds in Ethereum and other types of blockchains to make exactly that point. And so what's very apparent is the very vast majority of people use Bitcoin as a store of value, kind of like a digital gold. Now going to other use cases of the technology. Gustavo, you are the leader of the payment practice here in Brazil, and you have been working with financial institutions for quite a while now. So how can blockchain technology be used for those clients? So blockchain can be used in, in different ways, right? And I'll give you a few examples that we are seeing happening around the globe. So for instance, on trade finance, Right, blockchain can record trade transactions and give assurance to buyers by tokenizing the traded assets, right? And this will make this process much more efficient. On cross-border payments, right, that is typically slow and expensive due to many requirements, blockchain can facilitate the transfers of the transfer of values between buyers and sellers, lowering the cost of, of cross-border payments, right? On trade clearing and settlement as well, right? It can facilitate those processes, it can simplify, it can reduce the cost, right? It can be used as well for digital identity and know your customer. Right? in different ways. It can be used on asset lending, on payments, on trading. And there, there are many, many cases that are emerging more and more, always trying to facilitate, many times reducing the costs and make those transactions more secure. So you mentioned the transactions. Why haven't the blockchain uh, or the use of crypto assets have been used in a more wide way for payment transactions? Why do you feel, why do you think uh, the, the shortfalls and advantage of using blockchain for payments specifically? So I think we will need to make some design choices in order, in order to do that, right? To make blockchain more secure, it usually decreases the efficiency, right? And, and this is a trade-off. So for a global pay payments blockchain, in specific use cases, we'll need to determine the trade-offs between security, speed, and scale. Right, so I'll give you a few examples. So the size of the blocks, right, the number of confirmations that are required, right, the on versus off chain transactions, all these impact the cost and the speed of the transactions. And we will need to define those parameters and, and whether we need more security, less security, more speed, less cost, and so on. And this will be important in order for blockchain to expand into payments more broadly. But you just mentioned that uh, you can track the address and know if it's a black market address and you can actually track all the transactions that that address made. How do you protect, on the other hand, the individual that earns that asset, right? How do you protect for people not to know exactly how much I earn and how much I transact? Yeah, that is another really good question. Um, on the, so in blockchain, there's actually there's, there's two worlds or two types, right? One is the, what they call public permissionless space. This is what the Bitcoins and Ethereums of the world where everything tends to be public. Anyone can read the blockchain and anyone can write onto the blockchain. That's why they call it public permissionless. As long as you have, uh, you know, a node and an internet connection, you can kind of do both. 
In those instances, it's incredibly hard to preserve your privacy, at least if someone has figured out what your wallet address is. Your wallet address is just a string of you know letters and numbers. Normally, people have no idea who it is. But the moment your wallet address is known, privacy is very difficult to keep. There are technology innovations that people are starting to bring forward that would enable a level of privacy on the public chain. But right now, privacy tends to be difficult to achieve, at least on those public permissionless networks. There's an entire different category of chains that tend that what they call private and permissioned. This is the stuff like Corda and Hyperledger Fabric, where the people who are allowed to run nodes, validate transactions, write data onto the chain are permissioned and selected by a particular institution or consortium. So it's not just like, hey, I want to enter it. I want to get access to all the information. It doesn't work that way. You have to apply and be allowed into this particular consortium. Because of that setup, there are also a lot more degrees of freedom that people can set on who is allowed to see which transaction. Because clearly, even in the consortium type of setting, you don't want your competitor to see all the transactions that you're doing. So the concept of privacy, in a way, has largely been solved, but it is on the private and permission side. On the public and permission space, there's still some technology innovation that needs to happen to fully address that. Ian, we just heard Gustavo talking about a little bit about the use cases on the financial industry and in payments specifically. Uh, but when you think about blockchain and the ability of actually tracking the history of something, uh, the, th the first thing that also pops to mind is supply chain, right? The ability to track all the, the, the chain of a supply chain. So what are the use cases on the supply chain industry and how, how do you feel that clients, for example, can, can work on that? Yeah, no. Um, in so the, the two big fields that people that really have um, so far been successful in applying blockchain tech, I would say financial services and supply chain, right? And in the supply, supply chain piece in particular, what, um, what the players have done is making it very clear by logging every single step in the value chain as a good um, travels through it, by logging all of those entries onto a blockchain, it becomes very easy to see at any point in time, where is my good? When did it pass which checkpoint? And who has handled that particular good at that particular moment? Because everyone has an individual private key, right? And so because of that end-to-end -end visibility, it is very easy to see the full provenance of goods, right? It is very easy to have uh, the, full, the full track and trace and figuring out at any point in time where is a particular good? And because it provides visibility on who has touched which good when, the degree of fraud actually goes down quite significantly because people know that it's quite easily to track whatever it is they're doing, right? So from a supply chain perspective, we've seen very good um, implementations of it, typically related to full end-to-end -end visibility into the provenance of goods. And this is also in certain instances has added to additional product value I believe in China, certain goods that you can buy, particularly uh, the higher value goods, take something like meat, right? The meat, some meat that is tracked with blockchain technology has a particular QR code that people can just scan. It basically pops up which farm they come from, how did it travel to the store? Uh, it gives you a lot of information of that particular individual piece of meat in the, the farm that it came from. And people are willing to pay premium for that. So blockchain is supply chain really is very good at which moment in time. And there's already proven in certain instances to have a value that consumers are willing to pay for. So Ian, what about the uses in other industries? You just mentioned the meat market, you know, but we have people listening from a wide range of industries. Would you give us other examples, please, of uh, applications of this technology? You just said about meat, totally. but you have some others. <laughs> That's very curious. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, no, it is. Just, I love that use case. Um, there's quite a few other use cases. Um, so I would say in addition uh, to supply chain, clearly in financial services, this thing is very, very big. 
Um, we've talked a little bit about the store of value use case, Bitcoin is digital gold. So a lot of people putting investment into it. Um, we haven't really talked about stable coins just yet, but this is basically taking cash and putting it onto a blockchain such that you can use the blockchain infrastructure to do real-time payments. Uh, and we've seen tremendous growth in that. There's a field called decentralized finance as well, where financial institutions with the functionality that they provide in a way can be disintermediated by some of the smart contract functionality on chain. This is a very rapidly uh, emerging fields um, where at this point, hundreds of billions of dollars are being transacted on chain. But in addition to supply chain and financial services, I would say a couple of other areas worth highlighting um, as it relates to identity, right? You can use your own private key uh, really as a, as a ways to identify yourself. So as it relates to on-chain identity, on-chain credit scoring, some people have tried to implement different voting systems associated with it, such that you can do electronic voting, even shareholder voting, right, uh, is a big application. Uh, there is a rapidly emerging field related to NFTs in the creative economy. So issuing tokens or pieces of digital art or digital goods really could be in-game goods, virtual real estate, you name it issuing that on chain and by setting the conditions of a transfer, you're actually able to change the business model. So with an NFT, what you can do is the moment it is transacted, 10% of that transaction value goes to whomever created the NFT in the first place. So if you're an artist, for example, and you've issued a piece of digital art or song, it's just another piece of digital art, you can actually monetize it the moment that stuff gets transacted versus you having to make your money just on the initial sale. So there's a very big field of NFTs, particularly for enabling the creator economy and changing the business model associated with that. Uh, the last piece I'd say is on um, utilities and electricity. That's another piece where we get a lot of inbounds and requests. This could be applications around the tokenization of carbon credits. Uh, but increasingly also doing um, distributed power generation, in particularly for proof of work and Bitcoin mining. So tapping into particular areas where there's stranded electricity, where the converting that electricity or transporting that electricity onto mainland into various applications normally would be too expensive. But by installing a Bitcoin mining rig, which is really just a couple of graphic cards and computers, right? you can tap into those local sources of energy and electricity and really um, uh, increase the ROI on the installations that you already have built. So that's some of the applications that we're seeing. Um, but there's, there's like tens and tens more, but I would say those are the ones that have truly gotten a little bit of traction to date. But just, you mentioned three things that for me are really curious and then I want to take the time to just deep dive on each one of them. Sorry, not to all of them because we, we might not have time. The first one are <laughs> NFTs, right? Non-fungible tokens. There's a big yep. buzz in the art world. And that one, I won't deep dive right now because I feel like we need a, a whole session of a McKinsey Talks just to talk about NFTs. Hopefully you come back to talk <laughs> about N NFTs <laughs> specifically. But you mentioned two are the things that I, that I feel is important to deep dive. The first one is smart contracts, right? Which smart contracts are basically digital contracts that are uh, online, they're made via, uh, through algorithms and are immutable. So you, once the, the digital content is made, you cannot change it. What is the main difference between a smart contract and a bunch of lawyers making other contracts and how those two are living side by side on the digital world? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is, it's, a great, it's a great question. I think goes to the heart of why blockchain technology, particularly something like financial services or other applications could be pretty disruptive, right? What a, a smart contract is just a set of code that is written on a blockchain that supports smart contracts. Take Ethereum as the main example. Uh, it's just a very elaborate way of saying, if this, right? A lot of actions that we tend to do that could be translated into an if this, then that, right? If I um, send funds into a particular liquidity pool, let's say digital dollars, and I would like to get that equivalent value back in Ethereum. 
uh, if I deposit money in a bank account, I expect the bank to lend that out and receive an interest rate on it, right? And so it basically, it, can, it has the ability to pre-program a lot of if this, then that, which we're very used to, uh, but in an automated way. And so once that contract is set and people can engage with it, you don't really need the intermediary that normally would provide these services, right? And so because of that, there is a very big potential to disintermediate uh, a lot of the centralized entities that would exist. Because the code is set and people can read it, technically all the conditions of the if this and that are visible to everyone. And so you don't necessarily need to rely on the centralized institutions, all the terms and conditions, the lawyers that would enforce these contracts don't necessarily need that because the contract is code and you can only engage with it on the blockchain. And the last one, and I know now we have to take a few of the questions from the audience, but the last thing that for me, it's also a, a, a main polemic subject is the sustainability. And what I mean sustainability is environmental sustainability of the blockchain. You mentioned the use yeah. of energy, the use of uh, processing power. How sustainable is to have a world run on, on top of a blockchain? Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a, it's a phenomenal question and a topic that has gotten a lot of attention recently, particularly with the likes of Elon Musk uh, Elizabeth Warren in the US really putting the emphasis uh, on that aspect. I think a couple of things worth highlighting. There is no denying that right now the uh, proof of work algorithm, which is what consensus algorithms, the thing that powers the Bitcoin blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain, uses a lot of electricity, right? There's no point in denying it. Um, Having said that, I think the debate is potentially slightly more nuanced in the sense that within that energy usage, you have to look at the electricity mix. Because if the energy usage is really related to renewable energies, people may argue that it is slightly more sustainable. In that sense, when you look at the Bitcoin network and Ethereum network as a whole, it does tend to use a lot more renewable energy than our traditional grids because in certain instances where there is excess power, that's a lot of renewable energy, that power tends to be the cheapest, right? The whole game around mining is to have cheap power. But having said that, it is very, very clear that the energy demand right now of the proof of work algorithm is a lot. There are other consensus algorithms that use significantly less power. The main one being something called proof of stake. I won't get into the specifics of how it is exactly different, but the bottom line is the, the proof of stake chain uses a fraction of the energy, like it's incomparable. And so you have in the blockchain world, many of the existing protocols that either already operate on proof of stake or they're moving towards proof of stake, like what Ethereum is hopefully doing next year. Bitcoin, because of the way that it is set up and because of its value proposition, to be quite frank, will not move away from proof of work. But there is a real push there also towards making sure that increasingly the energy usage, the electricity usage, is powered by renewables. Gustavo, there's a question for you here. Uh, what's the implication for government institutions such as central banks? How will they keep up with this technology? Denise, I think this, this is a really good question. I think that we are not talking only about the central bank, but other institutions that are involved in this as well, like CVM, like the notaries, all the institutions that will be impacted. And they will need to follow up and understand how, as these technologies evolve, how they interact. So central banks are already doing sandboxes and testing and learning on the technology, on the change that this will bring. This will, these other institutions will need to do the same thing. So I think it's gonna be, it's gonna be a constant process of learning on, as, as this evolves. Okay, so now we are gonna go to the, the few questions from the audience. Actually, Marina said that you could do a whole section about, a whole session about uh, NFTs, but there is a question from the audience exactly about this. It says, in the past months, we saw the phenomenon of NFTs. Would you mind explaining what they are? Yeah, no, happy to. I will try to, 
I'll try to be brief because um, as was mentioned, you know, you could do a whole session on it, but um, an NFT just stands for a non fungible token. What that means is that every token or representation is unique. If you take something like Bitcoin or Ethereum or take something like cash, right? It is, uh, it is it is fungible, meaning that the moment you put it together with others, you can't differentiate uh, one versus the other, right? Non-fungible tokens are very different. Every single one is unique. What that means is you, uh, what it's typically being used for is pieces of art uh, or just unique elements in the digital world. You could even think of a title to a home, right? As an NFT, right? It's, it, a home tends to be unique, has a specific address related to it. Even something like movie tickets technically could be an NFT. The reason why there's such a big emphasis on NFTs right now is because it represents a bit of a fundamental shift to how consumers can view ownership. Artists can make money um, by selling their or distributing their goods. If you take the example of an artist, right? Normally, an artist will start off by not being very known and will sell their initial works kind of at a fraction. As they continue to build up their, um, their reputation, maybe future works tend to be a little bit more expensive. But also the reality is many artists, at least back in the day, would only really become famous after they've already died, right? So the, the monetization of an artist and their piece of work tends to be shifted towards the later stages. And many artists really don't even actually get to collect all the, the, the value of the art that they produced. That's the current state. In an NFT world, you can set up the smart contract that represents the token such that every time a transaction occurs and that piece of art is distributed, listened to, or shared or just transferred, right? 10%, 5%, 2.5%, doesn't matter. You can set that. Um, is being automatically transferred to whomever created that token in the first place. So if you're an artist, what this technology allows you to do is basically at any point in time, collect royalties in an automated fashion off all of your collective body of work anytime it is it, it exchanges hands. So from a business model and monetization and distribution perspective, it takes away some of the power that right now rests with the studios, the Spotify, the streaming services, the distribution channels, and puts it back into the hands of the artists who are creating the content. That's why there's a lot of emphasis. That's why a lot of artists are you know, going all in and, and, and shifting a lot of their art uh, online in the form of NFTs, um, because it's frank, quite frankly, it could be a better mousetrap for them. Wow, very interesting. Uh, we have another question here. As an, uh, as an organization, how do I prepare for this? For not the NFTs, yes. the, the whole thing that we talked here today. Totally, yeah, yeah. Um, very good question again. I would say a couple of things. Number one, it'd be very good to fully understand what is the impact of the blockchain technology on your business. I think the maturity of the tech tends to differ um, I mean, if you're in financial services right now, I would say it's quite imperative for you to understand how this thing works and what some of the potential impacts are in your business. If you are in uh, manufacturing, it may be, you know, on the supply chain side, but it may not be as relevant, right? So just continue to educate not only yourself, but uh, your colleagues, senior management of an organization to fully understand its disruptive potential. And then once you figure it out, what is the disruptive potential of the tech, there's various ways through which you can play. Uh, that typically tends to depend on your risk appetite into the space and the type of technology implementation you want to do. If it's really around this private permission space that we just mentioned, uh, that tends to be in the form of starting up consortia, setting up the right governance, there aren't necessarily any major regulatory hurdles or risk assessments associated with that. If you want to start playing more in the public permissionless space, whether that's related to Bitcoin, Ethereum, smart contracts, stable coins, anything of the sort, you name it, um, you'd have to figure out what is your risk appetite as an organization and how big do you want to play? Really identifying the set of opportunities that are most relevant for you 
And then it depends a little bit. Do you want to launch a product and keep that in-house with your own business? Do you want to spin out a new business, a new business unit um, into a new company? Or do you want to just make a couple of minority investments into a lot of the startups that are happening in this space? So I'd say those are kind of like the, the series of strategic decisions that I recommend all clients to make. Uh, and clearly that's something that we, we help our clients with on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, and this was super interesting. We could stay the whole day here talking about the subject. I feel like it's there's a lot of subjects we could do follow-on sessions on. So I hope you come back to talk about more about NFTs, ICOs, and other specific topics on blockchain. Thank you again for taking the time uh, and, and joining us today. Denise, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Marina. And Tayar também, Gustavo, muito obrigada a todos. Pela conversa de hoje, também queria agradecer a você de casa que mandou suas perguntas e você que ficou aqui acompanhando os últimos minutos essa conversa tão interessante. Para conhecer a agenda completa, vá a maquistalks.com. Lá você também terá acesso às outras sessões, as anteriores. E a sessão de hoje vai estar disponível na segunda-feira. E para quem gosta de ouvir podcast, essas sessões também são convertidas para áudio no Spotify. Então, vocês estão todos convidados a conhecer a gente por lá também. Muito obrigada, um ótimo fim de semana e até a próxima.